BBC Radio Wales. It's coming up to five past six. We'll have a look at the forecast in a moment. First, Simon is here with this report. Thank you, Tom. And if you were looking to tell the story of Welsh art, where would you begin? A museum, perhaps? An art gallery? Maybe an artist's studio? Or how about an industrial estate halfway between Cardiff and pont The stores of the National Museum of Wales are in Aladdin's cave of almost every aspect of Welsh culture, from archaeology to industry. But to me, what's most impressive is the art. Wow. <laughs> That's such a beautiful painting. Welsh art comes in all shapes and sizes. There's dozens of these Celtic crosses. Amazing. And from all ages. Evening. There's more than any museum could ever display or any person hope to see. There's so much here. It really is like discovering a treasure trove. Welsh art is an amazingly rich tradition, just waiting to be uncovered. I'm Hugh Stevens, a radio presenter from Cardiff. I grew up in Wales, surrounded by the music, literature and language that the country is famous for. But one thing we've tended not to shout about in Wales is our art. Oh, wow, look at that. In fact, it's been something of a missing piece in the culture, not just of Wales, but all of Britain. Now, I'm going on a journey to discover for myself the untold story of Welsh art. It's art that is beautiful, sophisticated and surprising. International, yet rooted in a proud and distinct place. It has the power to soothe, and to shock, to inspire and inflame, to challenge and to change. In this episode, I'm tracing the story right back to the beginning. The earliest Welsh art is big and bold and can still stop us in our tracks. It's radical and surprisingly modern, taking aim directly at the biggest questions of life. If you thought you knew the story of Welsh art, or if you thought there wasn't much to know, think again. My journey to discover the story of Welsh art starts on the island of Anglesey, in a wild and spectacular place. 5,000 years ago, there was no such thing as Wales and no such thing as art as we know it. Here on the western edge of the island of Britain, people lived in small groups, often close to the sea. Their homes were temporary shelters made of wood and earth. But there was one thing they built to last. Barclodia de Gaures is a prehistoric burial site. Constructed from huge stones, it's older than the Egyptian pyramids. But it's what's on those stones that's important for our story. There's a real atmosphere in here. 
What's really incredible are these lines on the rocks here. I've never seen anything like this. The triangles, the zigzags. And it's from 5,000 years ago. It's pretty mind-boggling, really. Beautiful. But do these ancient stones carry a hidden meaning in their patterns? George Nash is an expert who studied their secrets. George, how do you begin to explain this place to me? <laughs> well, we're in a, a Neolithic passage grave, so it dates to around about 3000 BC. We have to consider this monument as a church, and around that church there's a churchyard. This is a sacred landscape. The reason why we have a big dome here, which was put up in the 1960s, was because of its unique nature. What we found that we're, during the excavations of 1952-53 was rock art. Five stones scattered around the inner chamber of the monument, uh, which are highly decorative. So it's a, it's a very, very important site. It's only one of maybe two sites in the whole of Wales which have uh, ornate rock art incorporated into its monument. Can you tell me more about the specifics of the art on the rocks and what do we have on these stones, George? The interpretations, again, are, can be varied, but my view on the thing is this idea of, of life. We tend to look on life today as a very linear thing, where we're born, we live, we die. In the anthropological and ethnographic records, and also maybe the prehistoric records, maybe life is more circular in that we are we born, we live, we die, rebirth, live, die, rebirth. It goes on and on and on, hence the circularity of a lot of the symbols we see within this monument. And then we have these zigzag lines, which are very, very unusual indeed. And I think that what we've got here is this idea about bringing the wider landscape outside, which is very, very dramatic, inside the monument. So the little circle we have could represent a celestial body, such as the moon or the sun. And those zigzag lines could represent the Snowdonia Range. These stones might then carry the earliest depiction of a landscape in all of Britain. But situated inside a burial chamber, what was this art for? When they did the excavation, what was really remarkable, they found just actually where we're standing, just here, a small hearth. What you have to think about is that when this hearth was in use and people were being buried in these monuments, the flickering light would have illuminated the rock art. It would have made it dance. The elite families are being buried in these monuments and all the rock art, all five stones, are facing inward into the chamber. So if you're standing outside the monument, looking in, you can't see what, what is actually going on. I think what we've got is the elite seeing the art, but also more importantly, the dead are seeing the art as well. I think these are personal statements to the dead. It's very much art equals death or death equals art. The rock art of Barclodia de Gaures was created at the very edge of Britain. But early Welsh art was no isolated tradition. One extraordinary object shows how Wales sat in the mainstream of European creativity. It's perhaps the first Welsh masterpiece and it was discovered by pure chance. In 1833, a group of workmen were digging a field near Mould in northeast Wales. It was known as Bryn yr Ellyllon, Goblin's Hill, and said to be haunted by a ghostly boy dressed in gold. Their spades struck something solid, a stone-lined grave. And when they dug further, they couldn't believe what they were seeing. 
Today, it's one of the prize exhibits in the British Museum. This is the Mold Gold Cape, and it's without a doubt one of the finest and most intricate Bronze Age artefacts in the whole of Europe. It's made from one piece of gold, finely beaten out, and as you can see, there's patterns all across it, each tiny one intricately beaten and punched by hand. It's a beautiful thing, and it's thought to be up to 4,000 years old. The cape shows signs of wear, but we don't know what it was used for. It's not functional, you can't raise your arms whilst wearing it, so maybe it was used for ceremonial purposes. And it's small, maybe worn by a woman or a child. Perhaps it was used for sacred rituals, we can only speculate. But one thing's for sure, it's so fine and so beautiful, there's a good case for calling it a form of early sculpture. Wearable art, if you like. The cape was at the cutting edge of Bronze Age craftsmanship. Its elaborate patterns resemble strings of beads, an innovative design never seen before. We'll never know who made the mold gold cape, but it's hard to imagine a precious, intricate object like this traveling long distances. So whoever made it likely made it in Wales. The unique design of the cape went on to be echoed in continental Europe. And the cape, in turn, was buried with precious objects from the European mainland. This, then, was a very early example of art as an international, intercultural phenomenon. The mold gold cape really hammers home one thing. There can be this idea of Wales as being on the edges of things, the, the periphery, the wild and woolly fringe, if you like, in art, in history, even in geography. But early Welsh art proves that Wales was cross-cultural. It was interconnected with a lot going on, but maybe it was more westwards looking to the sea routes to Ireland and Europe than eastwards looking on the land routes to present-day England. Centuries passed, and the intermingling of European cultures only grew. In time, one people above all others became dominant, the Celts, and they express their essence in a haunting design. This symbol is very familiar to me. There's something quite mysterious and hypnotic about it. It's called the Triskel, and I'm aware of it because way before I was born, in the early 1960s, my dad ran a small poetry imprint called the Triskel Press. But I must admit, I don't know what it stands for or where it comes from. One of the finest examples of the Triskel design owed its discovery to the Second World War. On Anglesey, the lake of Llyn Cerrig Bach was being excavated to extend an airbase runway. Workmen came across a chain strong enough to haul a truck out of thick mud. It turned out to be 2,000 years old. Over 150 more objects emerged from the lake bed, the most important hoard of Celtic artefacts ever discovered in Britain. The most impressive was a mysterious bronze decoration adorned with a Triskel.
The Iron Age is the age of the Celts in Britain, and over about 500 years before the first Roman invasion, we get the establishment of the Celtic culture in the British Isles. The main thing that we see and know about the Celts is through the magnificence of their art, the really flowing forms and the Triscal symbol, which is quite an iconic Celtic symbol, the kind of emblem of elite Celtic culture. It's a very old design. It's been around for at least 5,000 years before then being taken on by the Bronze Age people and then again here in the Iron Age. When we look at the Llincerig Bach plaque, we have a really intricate Triscal design, but the way that it's been represented on the plaque, it looks as if it's a bird. Some people have suggested that the top part is a puffin head, and then the second part is the wing of the puffin with the legs coming down at the bottom. It's very difficult for us to really get into the mindset of what the Triscal meant to the Celtic people. But one thing that we know for sure is that they had a pantheon of gods or deities. They were interested in nature. And so potentially the symbol of the Triscal represents birth, life and death or rebirth or the circle of life or those types of, of ways of thinking is a reflection of nature through this magnificent art. What's amazing about the Triscal is how it survived almost organically in Welsh culture up to this day. You'll still see the symbol used in posters and murals, even in jewellery and as tattoos. It's become a kind of modern day logo for Celticness, a symbol of continuity and of independence of spirit. The Celts left an indelible mark on Welsh visual culture. but a very different belief system would shape the coming centuries. Christianity arrived in Wales in the early centuries AD. In time, small monasteries developed throughout the country. The first Christian masterpiece recorded in Wales was made by monks a work of unprecedented beauty and intricacy. Today, it's housed in Litchfield Cathedral, near Birmingham. Michelle Brown is one of Britain's leading experts on medieval manuscripts, and she's here to help me understand the secrets of this glorious book. So, Michelle, tell me about this book. What are we looking at here? We're looking at one of the great gospel books from the period of around um, the 7th through um, early 9th centuries that were amongst the boldest visual statements of their day. It's an incredibly um, finely produced book and you see more every time you look at it or a reproduction of it. You've got this beautiful image mm. of St Luke. Just look at him. He's got this George Michael designer stubble. You're not going to argue with him. Just look at that jaw. And he's got these wonderful, wonderful flowing locks looking very Egyptian with his rod and his staff, like a Coptic textile. And then we've got designs like this laid out using compasses, dividers, etc. And they feature Pythagorean and Euclidean geometry and Hebrew numerology, number symbolism. They're very, very intellectually sophisticated. You've got the birds, the flora and fauna. Everything is imbued with meaning. Who would have been responsible for making this book then? 
the work of producing something like this would fall to men and women who were professional religious in the key monasteries and cathedrals of the day. And for them, producing something like this would have been one of the greatest honours that you could perform as an act of penance, an act of spiritual input, a living prayer. And books like this would have been the most visited monuments of their day. They would be on the high altar of key pilgrimage sites where they would be visited by hundreds and thousands of people. And many of them would have travelled many, many, many miles in arduous conditions for a miracle of healing. Imagine it scintillating in candlelight. They would have been incredibly in awe. And the workmanship and the fine detailing is something that would have increased that awe. The origins of the Chad Gospels are unknown, but the first historical record finds the book at the Shrine of St. Taylor in Sandela, Carmarthenshire. We know that the book is in Wales in the mid-9th century. It seems to have been used as an oath book in Wales. You would come and actually make a transaction. You would swear on the Gospel book in the way that we swear on the Bible or the Quran in courts of law today. And this is when the first additions to the manuscript are made. And it includes the earliest examples to survive to us of Welsh handwriting and of the written Welsh language. So this is the oldest example we have of written Welsh. Wow. The book also contains a secret. As well as the written Welsh, there are names etched invisibly. Many of them surround the story of the birth of Christ. What we find here, if you hold it at a certain light, if you come down there, you just see, you can see some of the names. And they go all around the margins here, and they're all women's names. Why are they women's names only? It's women who are being allowed to mark their name as a living prayer. OK next to that passage. And it's been suggested that perhaps it functions as something that would guarantee fertility. So if you're hoping for a child and uh, an heir, and especially if you're having trouble producing one, that actually visiting the shrine for a miracle of healing, that entering your prayer in the form of your name, in, almost invisibly written on the page. Wow. The St. Chad Gospel Book was a unique, precious object housed in the most sacred of places. Soon, though, there would be a new kind of Christian symbol produced all over Wales and visible to everyone. It was really an early form of public art. Celtic crosses are one of the cultural treasures of Wales. Many are around a 1,000 years old, and some still stand in the holy places where they were originally erected, bearing the weathering of centuries. Wow. Here it is. I'm always slightly dumbstruck when I see something like this up close. It's huge, one of the tallest in Wales. And to think that it's over a 1,000 years old, older than the English language, older than the oldest castles in Wales, older than the church built next to it, even. And I get to stand here and marvel at its beauty and stand in its shadow. It's beautiful. Celtic crosses come in a huge range of shapes and sizes. Originally, they stood sentinel outside monasteries and important churches. But today, one of the best places to see the richness of the tradition isn't a holy site. It's this tiny museum just outside Patalbot. This is an impressive site. It's almost like there's been a collector out there, hunter-gathering, bringing them all together to one place. And what's really impressive about this collection is the sheer variety. A 
I do like these two in particular. They're massive, muscular, squat, like rugby players waiting to tackle, as if they could convert you to Christianity by their size alone. Choosing personal favourites is one thing. Understanding the history and symbolism of these crosses requires expert help. So, Howard, there seems to be so many different types of cross. How do I begin to understand them? Well, I think we have to assume they were expressions of faith, and that is an explanation at one level, but also they were articulating the status and identity of the church that you're coming to. If you were coming from afar, you'd know you were coming to a local distinctive monastery with its own almost brand of, of sculpture. Do we know who actually made these crosses? We suspect these weren't professional sculptors in the modern sense or even in the Renaissance sense. These were probably monks or indeed even abbots or bishops in some cases who were doing the carving and they were probably working across media. In, in, for these big Glamorgan disc-headed crosses, one idea is the inspiration for the style of the crosses comes from open work book covers. So the idea is they're taking up concepts from books and manuscripts, from metalwork and putting them into stone. Early stone crosses can be found all over Wales, over 450 of them. Their golden age ran from the 9th to the 11th century, and their captivating, intricate designs appear on memorials to this day. And what about these famous patterns? Where does all the weaving and the plaiting come from? Well, it all goes back to late Roman art originally, but by the 9th, 10th, 11th centuries, we're finding monastic communities across these islands using these different elaborate, abstract artistic devices. They're there to capture the eye and to draw you into contemplation of the cross itself and the biblical stories and one's own salvation. The other thing to bear in mind, of course, is that we're not looking at these stones as they would ever have been seen in the early Middle Ages because they would have been vividly painted. We're looking at rich, vibrant colours of golds and yellows, greens, blues, whites, blacks, and all the rich colours we find in early medieval metalwork and in illuminated manuscripts, they were probably daubing onto the crosses so that they were intended to be both beautiful but also striking and memorable. So they're a device that's about capturing your thought, almost, as much as meaning anything. Our relationship with religion has changed profoundly in the thousand years since these crosses were made. Yet somehow, they still retain their power to captivate the eye and the mind. Medieval Wales boasted a vibrant visual culture, supported by a network of native rulers and their courts. But violent change was coming. The last native Prince of Wales was killed by English soldiers in 1282. Despite uprisings, Wales never regained its independence. In the destruction of war, a huge amount of native art was lost. But when stability returned, it brought with it a new dawn for art in Wales. Tucked away in the small market town of Abergavenny on the Welsh borders is one of Wales's true masterpieces. This is one of the greatest wooden sculptures in all of medieval Europe. It's the Old Testament patriarch Jesse, father of King David, and it was carved way back in the 15th century from a single oak tree, which must have been enormous. You can still see the hollowed out trunk when you look around the back.
Jesse was a common figure in medieval churches. But the way he's represented here marks a quantum leap in Welsh art. It's the first time we've seen the human form represented realistically and carrying an emotional charge. The craftsmanship is exquisite. Folds of drapery, a belt buckle, even individual hairs all conjured up from one piece of wood with enormous delicacy. One of the things I love about this piece is how informal yet dignified it is. On one level, it's an old man with a magnificent beard stealing a nap with his head propped up. But there's a real sanctity and a sense of peace to it also. Originally, this sculpture would have been painted in lots of different colours. In fact, you can still see traces of paint in the drapery. The beard would have been grey, the skin pink, and in the indent in the forehead would probably have been a gemstone. But to me, what's most amazing about the Jesse is that what we see today is just part of the complete work. At some point, the trunk emerging from Jesse's side was cut brutally short, reducing the sculpture to a fraction of its original size. It is still possible, though, to see the story of Jesse in all its glory in Wales. In Denbyshire, the tiny village of Llanrhaeadyrynghinmerch is home to another masterpiece of medieval Welsh art, this time in glass. Here, the branch growing from Jesse's side is not cut off. It soars up, linking Old Testament kings and prophets David, Solomon, Moses, all culminating in the Virgin Mary and infant Christ. Simply put, it's Jesus's family tree. It really is an impressive sight. It's really beautiful, a blaze of light and of color. We haven't seen anything like this in the story of Welsh art to date. It's Welsh art gone technicolor. It's really impressive. What we're looking at here is one of the finest examples of medieval stained glass in Wales. It's very late in terms of the medieval period, right at the end, coming in the 1530s. It's remarkable because it's probably the most complete window in Wales. Why did they choose to make art on glass? Why not just paint on the walls? You know, because it's a difficult art form, isn't it? It's difficult, it's very expensive, it's very labour intensive. But you've got to remember that churches were painted throughout. We would have had painted sculpture, wall paintings, and so therefore extension of, of that artwork onto glass was a kind of a natural extension of it. You, you'd walk into a, a church and see colour everywhere. Do we know who made this window or where it was made? A window of this kind of size, wherever it was made, it wasn't made here. Uh, it was made in a studio. All the glass would have been leaded together, probably into panels, and those panels would have been brought here, probably on a cart of some sort, obviously with great care. No doubt pieces were broken in transit, and it would have been assembled on the site. A lot of stained glass windows have been lost. Do we know why this one has survived? So little medieval stained glass has survived in Wales, and there are a number of reasons for that. In the 16th century, uh, and the 17th century, there was a degree of iconoclasm because windows like this were offensive to Protestant reformers who did not want to see biblical scenes in windows, and therefore they were smashed. Now, there's a tradition that this window was taken down by local parishioners and kept for safekeeping while the parliamentarian forces were in the area. They could have taken it out section by section and put it in a big, big chest, here's a big chest. It could have gone in something just like this and taken away. It, it would have been a, a huge effort on behalf, of, on behalf of the community to save what, uh, a window which they thought was important and special to that community. 
I think one of the things that's outstanding about this window is the quality of the painting of the faces. We get a level of realism, characterization in the figures. There's a certain pathos about Jesse we can see here. Just looking at the hand and the face of Jesse, there's something quite special there, which you don't tend to see in uh, late medieval stained glass. I think my favourite thing about the window is that every man has a beautiful beard. Yes, it's a window for our times. <laughs> <laughs> The Jesse window is one of the highlights of medieval Christian art in Wales. But in churches right throughout the country, there are priceless treasures from shrines to effigies. Among all this, one place is unique. The Church of St. Cadoc in San Carvan in the Vale of Glamorgan, looks sedate enough from the outside. But going inside is like stepping into a medieval picture book. Oh, wow. This is quite the sight. I've never seen anything like this in a church here in Wales or anywhere else for that matter before. So we have St George slaying the dragon the Virgin Mary blessing him. We've got the king and queen in their castle overlooking and the princess with her pet lamb looking on as well. What's really amazing about this wall, of course, is that it was only discovered in 2008. Painting has been here for over five and a half centuries. For most of that time, it was underneath around 20 layers of lime wash but it was discovered, it's been restored, and it's an amazing sight. As well as the inspiring saints and monarchs, there's a darker side to the San Carvan paintings. A series of scenes shows the seven deadly sins with the sinners in torment. And that's not all. I'm weirdly drawn to this seen in the painting, Death and the Gallant, the young man in the fashionable Monmouth cap with the skeleton next to him, the skeleton in a shroud, there's a snake around his body and a toad where his heart should be. It's quite a sobering sight, really, quite scary stuff. I can only imagine what it must have been like for the congregation meeting here five and a half centuries ago who'd never seen paintings or pictures before. This would have been their equivalent of coming to the cinema, I guess, to see a particularly scary film. Christian art set in sacred spaces dominated the visual culture of Wales for centuries. But a huge shift would transform the way people saw the world. Art would no longer celebrate the glory of God, but the glory of man. And it was one man in particular who helped bring the change to Wales. So Emma, what is this object that we're looking at? So this uh, painting is called the Don Triptych. What we see is at the center panel, the Virgin and Child enthroned and attended by music-making angels. Around them, you have uh, two standing female saints, and these two saints are introducing the Welshman, Sir John Donne, who commissioned this painting. And they're standing in this very rich, grand room, which is a kind of loggia, which opens onto uh, a wonderfully peaceful panoramic landscape. John Dunn was born in the 1420s into a distinguished Carmarthenshire family. 
As a young man, he fought for the Duke of York and was rewarded with lucrative diplomatic posts. Travelling around Northern Europe, he moved in a world of royalty, riches and cutting-edge art. And in Bruges in the 1470s, he commissioned a painting from Hans Memling, the greatest artist of his day, who some think appears in the painting. At the time, this would have really been considered the very best. You could get not only in Bruges, but probably in Europe as a whole. Definitely in the British eyes, no one had seen anything like it. It's very virtuosic if you look at the way he paints the folds and the drapery. He uses this very, very deft hatching. It's quite quickly painted, but with such dexterity, which is someone who knows exactly what they're doing. Dunn is depicted with incredible vividness and realism. There's a real presence, and you can really tell that Memling would have definitely seen him and uh, probably uh, painted him uh, from life. You can see every single wrinkle, the eye bag, the strong eyelids, the wonderful stubble, very quickly painted. I really particularly like also the kind of like shaggy hair that he has. He's a bit disheveled. Everyone seeing this would have understood that this was commissioned for a very important individual from the best painter of the day. A really uh, completely extraordinary thing. So why would John Dunn have commissioned this painting? So he was uh, doing extremely well in, at this moment of his life. He would have wanted to have a really wonderful uh, object to advertise his taste and his connection to uh, the Yorkist court. You know, the object could have been packed away and traveled with him uh, on his many journeys as a diplomat. On the outer door, the depiction of Saint Christopher who is the patron saint of travellers, fits Don's very peripatetic career uh, really well. And it's thought to be the first painting of a named Welsh person, isn't it? Which is amazing. Yes, and quite a really important Welshman, quite a Welshman, <laughs> and with great tastes, I would say. He looks like a lot of Welsh people I know, actually. I've seen <laughs> John Dunn before. <laughs> John Dunn spent much of his life away from Wales, but it's been suggested that his great painting contains a subtle salute to his home country. Behind the sacred scene, the gentle landscape resembles not the flatlands around Bruges, but the Dunn family's ancestral home of Kidwelly. The shift in sensibilities marked by the Renaissance quickly spread throughout Wales. More and more, the individual became the focus of art, with a new realism its goal. Before long, wealthy Welsh patrons went from being devout extras in sacred scenes to the central subject of art. Who? you might ask, lives in a house like this. Well, at the start of the 17th century, it was the aristocratic Herberts. And if you have a huge house like Powys Castle to call home, you're going to need some art to decorate it. which is perhaps one reason why the Herberts became some of the most enthusiastic portrait patrons Wales has ever known. One person in particular was rather keen on visual display. These are very impressive tassels, John. They're <laughs> the nicest tassels I've seen so far. Yeah, they're well placed, aren't they? <laughs> they are, they are. What do we know about this uh, this handsome devil? Yeah, this is Lord Herbert of Cherbury. So he's from the powerful Herbert family who'd been living in the Welsh borders of England since the Middle Ages. 
and this is definitely their power base. And this is Lord Herbert of Cherbury, about 20 years old, as a sort of dashing young man. We have this amazing life, everything you can imagine a Renaissance courtier to be, that's what Herbert of Cherbury was. So he was a, a soldier, a poet, a musician, a traveller, but then he also kept coming back to Wales. So Wales was very much his retreat, it's where he wrote history books, it's where he wrote philosophy. He wrote an autobiography. This portrait is the earliest one we have of Herbert of Cherbury. So this is, you know, it's a huge portrait. It's his first a double at commissioning portraiture. So you can see his, his confidence of this guy, can't mm. you? And he's got his hand on his hip, his other hand sort of pulling his cloak away to one side, but it's also ready to pull the sword out of its scabbard. It's a man who's ready for action. You know, you can see he's a handsome man from the portrait, but it was something which was recognised by those around him. He was um, admired by the king, he'd been admired by Elizabeth I. I mean, he was so handsome that it got him into trouble. One of the court ladies had a, a miniature portrait made of him and was found with it in her bed, and this led to a duel with this lady's husband. So <laughs> this, he was, he just seemed to have been like this, a bit of a, a lady killer. Edward Herbert's portrait introduced a swagger into Welsh art that simply hadn't been seen before. But perhaps his greatest contribution was something far subtler, a supremely intricate work that's been called an icon of its age. John, this is a much smaller portrait, but a portrait nonetheless, and it's a very... Impressive one, isn't it? Why is he lying down so nonchalantly in a forest? In the, in the imagery of the time, if you see some of their head resting on their fists like that, that is the imagery of a melancholy man, which was seen as a, a disorder of the mind and body, and it made you morose and withdrawn from the world. But actually, in the poetry of the time, including his poetry, the idea of lying on the grass was like an invitation to a lady to come and join you. So he's there with a melancholy pose, but he has this smile on his face, which is inviting. The craftsmanship is second to none, isn't it? It's absolutely exquisite. It really draws you in with the level of detail that's involved, that you can get closer and closer and closer and more and more details emerge as you look. The artist was a famous miniaturist of the time who painted for the royal family called Isaac Oliver. And it was so finely painted that he was using brushes with individual hairs to paint some of the details of it. If you look closely, each individual hair on his beard is painted with exquisite care. You know, each eyelash is painted. And you can see this beautiful landscape winding out into the distance with a, a river winding out to the sea. And we know it's going out to the sea because it has a sailboat on it. So it's that sense of him being in this retreat mode, but then this reference to his many travels to Europe in the background as well, and all captured in this tiny picture the size of a tablet. It says an awful lot about him in such a small, beautiful picture. Yeah. It's very impressive, isn't it? And, yeah, and it's the, 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 the artistry of it itself, the preciousness of it is a statement. Pictures like this were seen in small cabinets, so small rooms or small chests. We know that they were uh, wrapped in paper and unfolded. They were held, they were sometimes kissed. Um, so they're very intimate, private works of art. He'd have kissed it himself. <laughs> it's very likely, isn't it? <laughs> Judging by the autobiography, he wouldn't be averse to kissing his own portrait. <laughs> With his art, Edward Herbert helped move Wales into the modern age. Bold and playful, it pushed the sacred to one side, putting human experience firmly centre stage. And in South Wales, another noble family took things a step further, 
they made pictures out of personal relationships and even the very house they lived in. Sounds to me like all the ingredients for a 17th century Hello! magazine spread. The Mansells of Glamorgan were a fine family grown rich on the dissolution of the British monasteries. They acquired Margam Abbey and its lands near Patalbot and set about turning it into a grand house in the latest style. They even incorporated the Abbey's former chapter house into their fancy new home. In 1603, Sir Thomas Mansell, the head of the family, married Jane Pole. To mark the occasion, he commissioned a portrait with one very unusual feature. I do love this painting. I think it's one of my favourites. It's a delicate vision in black and white. And I love Sir Thomas and his stern pose, his mighty fine beard, and Lady Jane next to him looking slightly more reserved, maybe. And I love the little details as well, the weatherings of life, the eye bags and the wrinkles on their faces. But what I really love about this painting is that for all its formality and the fine dress, the couple are holding hands. The Mansell's public display of affection might not look like much today, but in the art of the time, it was almost unheard of. And that's not the only touching detail in the portrait. If you look in her other hand, Jane's holding a flower. It's a marigold, which is a symbol of grief. And five years prior to this painting being made, her previous husband had died. It's thought that she's holding the flower in remembrance of him. Before long, though, grief turned to joy. When the Mansells had a daughter, Mary. And it was Mary who took the place of the flower in a second portrait. But the Mansell family hadn't finished with art. In 1690, Thomas and Jane's descendants commissioned two views of Margam House and its lands. It was one of the first times a Welsh home had been the subject of a painting. And what a home. The house has long gone, but you can still see traces of it today. The Greek and Roman style statues on what would have been the summer banqueting pavilion. The pavilion wasn't the only fancy feature of the Margam house paintings. The unknown artist opted for a bird's eye view, something rarely seen before in Welsh art. And like all good house shoots for the glossies, it does look pretty spectacular. As the 18th century dawned, there was no shortage of remarkable art in Wales. But wasn't there still a missing piece in the jigsaw? The subjects were Welsh, the patrons were Welsh, paintings were hung in grand Welsh houses. But almost without exception, the artists themselves came from elsewhere. As the years rolled by, though, homegrown Welsh art began to blossom. In rural Mid Wales, one man has dedicated decades to identifying and gathering together the work of Welsh artistic pioneers. One of the earliest and most important was John Lewis. So, Peter, tell me about uh, this young girl and what's the story behind this painting? Well, this young lady is called Elizabeth Gwynne and she's from a house called Taliaris down near Llandeilo in Carmarthenshire. It was painted probably in about 1737, 
And the painter was almost certainly John Lewis. It's a very early painting by John Lewis, probably the earliest one we have. John Lewis is a very interesting character because we don't know anything really much about him personally, but we know a lot about his painting because he was quite prolific and his career is based fundamentally in Wales. And that's why he's very much gone under the radar, of course, um, because only the London painters were really carefully noted. He's really important for us because it's in the 1730s and with his career in particular that you start to get a consistent pattern of um, a professional practice developing in Wales. You've got to remember that there's no art world as such in Wales in the 18th century. So John Lewis finds himself a client in Carmarthenshire and that client is related to another client in somewhere else in Carmarthenshire and by recommendation John Lewis goes from house to house. So it's a very different kind of professional practice to what you get in London in the period, but it's definitely there. His career lasted about 40 years, and we got paintings from both ends of it. So we can see how he changed and how he responded to changes in the art market in the period. One of the characteristics that stays, which is quite interesting, when he's painting women especially, you get these very square sort of faces, quite heavy cheekbones. Lots of artists have these particular ticks about their style and you can follow that right through. But there is quite a rapid development from this into more sophisticated pictures like the portrait, which is what, 10, 12 years later, of Diana Price of Newtown. Diana the Huntress, she's portrayed as, which is really a very sophisticated product. At the same time that Lewis was painting, a clutch of Welsh artists was emerging. They painted everything from royalty to self-portraits. One of them, William Parry, trained at London's Royal Academy and went on to become the leading Welsh portraitist of his day. He even created a Welsh icon, a portrait of his blind father, John, playing the harp. Art in Wales was flourishing through shifting cultures, violent conflict, and newfound stability, a cultural identity had been born and found visual expression in art. In the next episode, Welsh art leads the world as revolutionary artists transform the way we see the landscape. as ordinary Welsh people are painted for the first time. And as Wales itself changes beyond all recognition. <laughs> <laughs>